Welcome listeners to So Very Wrong About Games, a board game podcast about, hey, you guessed it, board games. We're going to talk about the game we reviewed exactly one year ago. Then we're going to talk about the games we played this week, the news and why it doesn't matter, and the topic of the week, which is done with Simon. I think your enunciation is a little off, Walker. By the way, thanks for introducing me. I'm your co-host, Mark Bigney. My what? friend over here is Michael Walker. Oh, that's, that, that's For those of you that care a great deal about our proper names out of context, the topic that I proposed was done with Simon, not done with Simon. Oh, we'll sorry. see. It, it, I suppose it matters. We will teach the controversy. Oh, wait, there's a well, there's well and when you messaged me, I guess you did have a question mark. At the I end. did. And it was within the quotation marks a as pun- well. A punciation matters. A punciation. A punciation? I said that on purpose. On, on, on punch. So the Aurus, the as yet unnamed retrospective intro segment. We reviewed Imperial Spells and Steam, the utterly bizarre train-ish game by Trey Chambers in Level 99 Games. Like many Level 99 games, this is a more-is-more approach to game design. More special powers, more train cars, more weird terrain effects, more glitz, more glamour, and... When you have the little plastic trains of the little plastic train company. It looks that much better. Looks that much better. That, is, that has been the excuse I've had for pulling Imperial Spells and Steam out again for a few rounds. Not that the game is deficient in any way. And indeed, it comes with lovely little sculpted plastic trains. But the little plastic trains from the little plastic train company are indeed superior. Not a sponsor in any way. Just nope. to be clear. I like it because it, it's sort of like you build in your own little tableau. And it's, it's well represented in sort of your train cars and your... You know, making the, having all these interesting special abilities and they come up off the deck and you sort of try to get this synergy going. Very interesting game. Love it every time it's on the table. It's very nice. It has a lot of variety to it. It has a lot of interesting combos that you get to build yourself while not feeling overburdened. You know, a long combo ridden turn doesn't really exist. You have these short combo ridden turns, which are definitely to my preference, and it doesn't overstay its welcome, although it is absolutely one of those sprawling products of Kickstarter, which we will be spending a lot of time in the topic, no doubt, talking about. There is going to be another expansion, a very, very small expansion that has been held up in shipping limbo for quite some time, as well as a whole bunch of errata for other Level 99 Games products. This is one of those things where I've been getting updates over the course of the past six to eight months that I've just been skimming to the effect of, oh, nothing really happening, okay, move along. You know the type. So there's going to be more Imperial Spells and Steam content someday, maybe? And that's Imperial Spells and Steam, designed by Trey Chambers of Level 99 Games. Lovely game, have enjoyed revisiting it with the excuse of the little plastic trains. Now on to the games we played last week. Mark, I got to play a game called Marvel Dice Throne. Dice Throne has been out for quite a while, and when I read up on it, read up on it, it looked like a advanced Yahtzee. And then sure enough, it played out much like that. Butterfly enjoys Yahtzee. Usually when we play a game together, it's either Yahtzee or Skippo. So I said, hey, this could be something. And I was surprised that I thought a modern take on Yahtzee would give you more choices or more sort of depth. But what made you think about what Yahtzee offers, right? Because it's that you always must fill in a line on Yahtzee. So you're making sacrifices. When you make a roll, it's like, okay, this is terrible. I'm going to try to fix it. I'm going to, you know, take the twos and, you know, sacrifice that lane. Nothing there's nothing in that in Dice Throne. You're just rolling every turn, three re-rolls, just trying to get your best. Okay, well, this time I do five damage instead of six. Oh, no. Mm. Remember, this is just on one play. There is a little bit of card play in there as well that, you know, helps you get a few extra re-rolls and you get to increase your, you know, you get to increase your abilities, like the things you have to roll for, straights or, you know, your symbols that you're you're shooting for. So there's a little bit more there, but I was looking for something a little more modern feeling and not you know a step backwards from Yahtzee are you apt to go back again yes for sure there was I got the set that had like the four characters in it so I would like to see how because they do they do a nice job of uh they put a star system on them to say the complexity so there's some that are a little more complex so I'm wondering if they play a little bit differently and hopefully give you more choice Dice Throne is very highly regarded by a number of people who normally have similar tastes to me in dice games. I'll be interested to hear how the more advanced characters feel, whether they satisfy your demand for more intricate and choice-laden gameplay. Well, you and I will just have to play it, because it really is a two-player game. Remember, we talked about they have 
awful. I shouldn't say awful. It wasn't terrible, but it's sort of sort of like a side. Hey, you can add more players if you want. Right. Tacked on free for all slash yeah. team based multiplayer rules. I play lots of skirmish games, Walker. I am very accustomed to such rule sets. Really is a one on one game. Marvel Dice Throne put out by Rocks the Games, designed by Gavin Brown, Nate Chandler, and Manny Tremblay. Played another game of Yggdrasil Chronicles. I've had this game for a few years, haven't played it for a while. This is a co-op game about the end of the world according to Norse mythology, so obviously right up my alley. And I just want to note that one of the key appeals of Yggdrasil Chronicles is the stunning artwork. It really is thoroughly engaging, and it, it's married to incredibly evocative and yet very functional component design. And it actually caused me to look back and say, who, who are these artists? What else have they done? And the artists are Maeva de Silva and uh, Christine Deschamps. And I actually discovered that Christine Deschamps passed away not too long ago. And that might be one of the reasons why we haven't seen more work from that pair, because they tended to work together as far as the uh, board gaming sphere was concerned. So that's terribly sad. Anyhow, Ages of Chronicles really is a beautiful game with lots of lush illustrations of various aspects of Midgard and Asgard. Lots of interesting god abilities. I talked about this before when first playing it. Loves lo Lovely little corner bits that are designed purely to appeal to Mark. For example, if Fenrir escapes from his cage, his cage which is actually constructed of markers, which go out to cover various elements of the board, which are caused by other effects, you will possibly lose a turn. Not good. Unless you're Tyr, because Tyr can deal with Fenrir in a way that other gods can't. So yay for that. The problem that I have with Exorcist Chronicles, and, and every time I look at the box and I think about how awesome the components are and how well executed the theme is, I keep thinking, why don't I like this game more? And then I play the game and I remember, it's because you're just stalling for time. A whole bunch of co-op games are about stalling for time until the right pieces fall into place. Pandemic, for example, does a very good job of hiding the fact that you're waiting to draw the right cards, and then what you have to do is coordinate to make sure that the cards are in the right hands. Exorcist Chronicles doesn't even have that supplementary step. You are literally just stalling for time. And so you're just putting out fires as they come out. The elements of preparation are there, but they're just to prepare to put out fires better. You're gearing up for combat, which will then smack the gods when, uh, you know, when, when Gorm gets out of control, or when Hell escapes from wherever, or Loki's wandering around, or you need to put Fenrir back in the cage. Everything is in service of these eventual combat roles. And so it has a certain monotony to it. You don't feel like you're proactively building towards anything in a way that other successful co-ops manage to do, even if that is just an illusion. And so ultimately, I, I feel like right around the mid-game, after I've gotten into a rhythm of things, I really do feel like I'm just waiting for the end to come. That's not a good sensation when playing. And so I think it's really incumbent on board games, especially co-op ones, to do a better job of making you feel like you have some degree of agency rather than just waiting out the clock. All of that having been said, just seeing it set up in all its three-dimensional glory, seeing the full Yggdrasil, the world tree, and you're moving up and down the world tree, and different areas get adjacent to each other, these lovely custom meeples, the strength of Surtur is a function of how many fire giants have been woken up. And when you wake up a fire giant, you take one of the custom fire giant meeples with a slot into it, slot it into the, the space at the bottom of the tree, and that shows the number that is now Surtur's strength that you have to deal with every time you want to put Surtur back into the fire pits. It's just wonderful. So I'm willing to tolerate it every now and again, even though I find the gameplay somewhat substandard, because it does such a good job of evoking the theme and of really giving you a visual feast while playing around. We commented back when we first reviewed it, uh, because you played it once, is that it really puts the Everdell tree to shame. Because the Everdell tree is big, but it's not very functional. It only exists to hold things, and you can only interact with it from one angle. The Yggdrasil tree in Yggdrasil Chronicles is usable from 360 degrees around the thing, and it's actually representative of different areas that correspond to how they were around the world tree in Earth mythology. Anyway, I could talk for a long time about its visual appeal, but the gameplay deficits make me not want to come back to it particularly frequently. So that's Yggdrasil Chronicles, designed by Cédric Lefebvre, and published by Ludonat. And just as a note, for those that play the old Yggdrasil game by Ludicali, they are not very similar in terms of execution, even though they are similar in terms of theme and some visual design elements. So that's Yggdrasil Chronicles. You and I got to bring Brian Boru back to the table. This is The King of Ireland, designed by Pierre Sylvester and put out by Offspray Games. And it's sort of like a, not sort of like a, it is a trick-taking game. 
And yet not. <laughs> yet not. In, in lots of cases, you want to lose. And it's interesting gameplay. It's like you're actually playing cards in order for you to lose later or playing cards early so you'll lose right away. And because and you can orchestrate this because you're drafting the cards at the beginning of each round. There's so that, – that sort of back and forth with drafting the cards and, and wanting to win and lose is, I think, the key part of the game because there are – there are losing lets you spread out from where you already are. Not only that, the benefits are fairly are much better from winning as well. Winning just gets you onto the board if you're not there yet or into new areas. And the map is laid out very interesting as well because you can only spread out along the road. So you can see where there's instant fights or or if you've went if you are the leader, like you're winning the tricks, you get to choose where the fights are. So you can make sure that no one's getting into new longer roadways or it's blocked off or lots of interesting things in Brian Boru. Pierre Sylvester is a fascinating designer. One of the things that's the hallmark of a lot of Pierre Sylvester's designs, and this was definitely true of the King is Dead slash the King of Siam, and is also true of Brian Boru, is you can't drop the ball on anything. You feel like there are all these plates that are spinning in the air, all these different resources. And if you're short on any of them, you can really suffer as a result. It's this feeling of, of honestly, this is going to sound exaggerated, but it's actually true. I kind of feel helpless when I'm playing a lot of his designs because I can't cognize how I can do well in all the different things that are required, even though they're very simple designs. For example, in The King is Dead, the way you win is by having the winning faction have more of your influence than anywhere else. Well, but if you have influence in the faction, you're spending that time influencing the faction and degrading their board presence. So in order to win, you need to weaken the faction that you want to... Ugh. Same thing happens in Brian Boru. It's like, oh, I'm winning all these things on the map. Oh, wait, I didn't do enough on the Viking track, so the Vikings take one of my cities. Or I neglected the church track, and now my opponent has managed to double their influence in one of my regions, and so it's not my region anymore. It's delightful in terms of the way the gameplay elements intersect. And actually, I prefer Brian Boru to The King is Dead, because even though the latter is much more simple, it's it's directly the sense of, of self-harm that is required <laughs> that I think makes the angst yet more pronounced. It's really clever in a lot of ways. There's some elements, though, that I don't know if they actually manifest or if they're meant to manifest at all. So you mentioned that, you know, often you want to lose tricks, as it were. You're not obliged to follow suit, and there's no trump. Relatedly, lower cards, if they win a trick, give you massive bonuses. Not only do you get to place on the map, which is usually what you get when you win a trick, but in addition, they might give you other bonuses that would typically only accrue to you if you had lost a trick of that suit. I don't think in... I've only played twice, mind you. I don't think I've ever seen one of those quote-unquote low cards win a trick. I don't know if there's really a way to make sure that they can... Precisely because you don't have to follow a suit. I mean, how is it that I'm supposed to look at this four red, even with drafting, and hope to win a trick with it when there's a wild suit that can contribute to anything? It's weird. All of my normal trick-taking intuitions seem to balk at a lot of what happens in Brian Boru. I don't know if at the other end of relearning this that I'm going to see new levels or if it's just a weird intersection. Maybe it's just, I think maybe it comes with multiple plays. It's like take a really high yellow and then multiple yellow, uh, low reds, right? And then so you, you flood the market with low reds to try to get people to, to play theirs and then win a trick with your high yellow. And then now you've got sure these lo one low red left. I, I don't know if it's worth the amount of planning that it would <laughs> take to get them out. It might be one of these things where you just luck out, right? I've, I've, exactly. I, I've tried to do it. Because indeed, indeed, conceptually, that's the way that it happens. You need to wait until there's no reds or draft so that you have almost all the reds. Wait for the wild cards to get played. Then somehow seize the initiative and then win tricks with a really, really low card. I've tried to draft to get that to be done. I haven't really seen it happen. So I, I just don't know if it's a weird interaction or if it's a potentially interesting interaction. At any rate, I've enjoyed Brian Boru. It's quick. It's engaging. It's got lovely Celtic artwork. I'm a fan. Happily play. Yeah, the amount of gameplay for the amount of time it takes to play is substantial. Absolutely. Another another solid pair of Sylvester design, no doubt. Played another game of Massive Darkness 2 Hellscape. More on Massive Darkness and related projects later. But this is with the two Louis, uh, who adore conflict and adore lots of plastic. And indeed... It remains good, solid fun. Now, games like this often live or die by strength of the scenarios, and the early scenarios 
I mostly skipped because I, I'd read that the chatter online said that the early scenarios were too easy. And there was a common complaint of the original Massive Darkness for a lot of the scenarios. And so we skipped right to, uh, it, honestly, it was a rather interesting scenario. There's this cursed sword that you have that accrues corruption and gives automatic damage to whoever's holding it at the top of the round and eventually just outright kills them. So you have to play hot potato with the cursed sword and run around and destroy these various crystals with the cursed sword. It was really cool. At various points, we all had the sword. We all had obligations either hold it just to accrue wounds or at one point my badass armored centaur was tossed the sword to go dive about 23 movement points away and get rid of the last objective point i enjoyed it it's great dumb fun it's probably one of the best dice chuckers i played in the past few years and as a consequence the crowd was sufficiently enthused that all the Massive Darkness, and it is massive, has been left there, and we will be playing it again on the reg, because it very much satisfied their desires for such things as well. So that is Massive Darkness 2, Hellscape. You used to want me to play it. You haven't expressed any interest, Walker. Uh, I, we, we record this. You yes, know that, right? Yes, and I'm sitting right here, and, and, and I say things, and sometimes you engage with me, seldom. And multiple times I've said, I can't wait to come back and bring Massive Darkness 2 so I can try it. These are words... That came out of my mouth. That doesn't mouth. sound like things you would say. You're expressing enthusiasm for our return. Sounds very much unlike you. So talking about interesting scenarios, we put Paint the Roses back onto the table and we decided to force ourselves to play one of the, I guess, story decks. And I quite liked it. I like how it changed up the game just quite subtly, but enough to make it engaging, at least for me. The rest of the table didn't seem so engaged, but in this one, we were like destroying parts of the... I liked it a lot. I don't uh, know what you're talking about. Of the bushes. And you you're saying, I don't pay attention to what you say? Wow. I said some of the people at the table. <laughs> this is designed by Brent Goldman and put out by North Star Game Studio. Anyway, Paint Rose is fantastic. Everyone has a puzzle card that no one else can see but them, and you sort of have to make inferences of what they have from the clues that you're putting down on the table. Never fails, and I can't wait to play more of these different stories and see how they all sort of... I hope they, you know, do a, as good a job as changing up the game as this first one did. We played a scenario with the Jabberwocky, and in order to win, we needed to burn down enough of the garden. Well, not burn down. Jab Jabberwocky uh, is not really an arsonist, more of a vandal, uh, just outright destruction. And it was interesting talking about co-ops where the goal is just to stall for time. That is indeed the victory condition of a normal game of Paint the Roses, just stall for time. Not that I've ever won a normal game of, game of Paint the Roses. This is the first time I'd ever won, and it was interesting because you have to meet certain conditions in order to destroy tiles. But the problem is the more you do that, the less information enters the system. And so you have to play this balancing act, this triage, between advancing your victory conditions and having the means at your disposal to stay alive. So I thought it was great. It was an interesting, as you say, level of nuance. It was a victory condition that subtly interacted with the deduction without adding additional burdens onto the specific elements of the deduction itself. And so I thought it was a winner. I'm very curious to see what the other wrinkles that the scenario decks add. Now, to bring up a game that didn't do so well when it came back to the table, we took out Decorum and it turned into a little bit of a slog fest. The conditions and it might be because it was three-player. I'm not 100% sure. We did play – every other game we played was, was with the full four. This is the first time we've played with three, so we all got, like, sort of an extra clue. I'm not sure if that changed mm. the game as much. I don't think so, but just – it is something worth mentioning, I think. Interesting question, yes. And it, it just seemed to slog out a bit longer. Maybe it was the, the group that we had, because usually when we play it, we have those people that want to sit and figure out exactly what people are doing and why and why they change it in certain ways. Whereas we just like to uh, randomly shake the house around and see <laughs> like a I giant being, eight ball. I think you're being unfair. I know. Well, <laughs> well, because this is my second time playing Decorum. The first time we played was with the two of us, Huey and Dewey. And this time, the only difference was that Dewey wasn't there. And so there certainly weren't any note-taking tryhards present to salvage us for the first game. If you'll recall, my comments about the about Decorum after playing it for the first time was a whole bunch of somewhat arbitrary moves happened with a whole lot of very pleasant role-playing 
with respect to how hideous this lamp is or how crucial it is that this American Gothic eyeball be present in the bathroom and only the bathroom. And that part was wonderful and very much encouraged by the game. Talk of fulfillment, talk of how Henry is ruining everything. That is an example of the kind of feedback that you can issue (laughs) during discussion rounds. And that part was great. And the victory when we won the first time we played was entirely unexpected on my part. We just, someone made a move and then someone's like, I, uh, uh, I'm good. Are you good? We're all, we're all good. We win. The difference here was the play felt very much the same, except there was never that end point of everyone saying that they were happy. Things just got worse and worse and worse. And I will note that at the end, when we gave up because we gave up, I, I actually had, like, stress dreams about decorum. I, I attributed to decorum. I had this weird stress dream where I knew that something was wrong because, I, I'm not kidding, my pants didn't match the color of paint in a bathroom. And so I have to attribute that to my association with decorum. It so scarred me. True story. When we finally revealed, just made public all the requirements, it took us a little bit to, with fully open information, get it to satisfy all our requirements. Exactly. I was going to say that as well. So I, 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 it would be quite surprising if we could do that without having all the information. Everybody. So I have to think it's the scenario because I think in the early scenario, we just had easier sets of requirements. It's true. This one was very specific. Oh, yeah. And there was only a couple ways that it was going to go down. Anyway, that is Decorum, designed by Charlie Macklin, Harry Macklin, and Drew Tenenbaum. Put out by Floodgate Games. Two cooperative deduction games with excellent, excellent theming. I played a game of Horizon Wars Zero Dark. The Humverker and I have been getting back into tabletop miniatures games. And Horizon Wars Inc., I think, is rapidly solidifying itself as my favorite tabletop miniatures rule system, even more so than Infinity, because... The way solo play works is just so incredibly well done. The way bonus actions work, the resolution system is, is, is incredible. I really think that in order for a tabletop miniatures war game to really grab me, the resolution system has to be interesting. It doesn't have to be cumbersome. It doesn't have to be overloaded with modifiers. And indeed, I prefer when it's not, but it can't just be a simple sort of, well, how high did you roll? I mean, rolling high is obviously going to be better. There's this marvelous system here where your stat is just the number of 12-sided dice you roll, and you try to add the specific dice together in ways to get combinations of the numbers you need to meet or exceed. And armor checks are just made against those specific dice. If I have two bits of armor, right, I roll a couple 12-sided dice. If I roll a 5 and an 8, that means that if you rolled any 5s or any 8s, well, I cancel one of them out with my armor. And so it's just this, it's a very, very novel system using 12-sided dice, which are underused little bits of polyhedral excellence and i really do appreciate the the setting of near future sci-fi of special ops teams in almost total darkness often doing daring things against an enemy force controlled by an ai and we just had a great time it was not overly cumbersome even though this was only the second time that the hanworker had played the game he remembered a lot of the rules despite that and I think that Roby Jenkins is a genius. He's done a number of rule systems. I'm very much looking forward to his future output. He's also got a podcast for what it's worth that he publishes on YouTube under his uh, publishing house called Precinct Omega. He talks a lot about the industry. He talks a lot about business happenings, which are things that I always find fascinating. And he's definitely a voice worth listening to. So that is Horizon Wars Zero Dark. Just very quickly, we got to get put Skull back on the table. It is a fantastic sort of bluffing, get in the person's head type of game where you're putting down coasters and eventually starting a bid to try to guess how many coasters you can flip up without flipping up a skull. So good. And this is designed by Havar Marley and published by Space Cowboys. Also very quickly played another game of Dungeons and Dragons, Dungeon Scrawlers, Heroes of Undermountain. I love this game so much. (laughs) I talked actually in an episode of Bloat, which is one of the Patreon only shows that we do. I talked about how my recent experiences with VR has really underlined the extent to which board games do some things better than video games and some things really, really worse. Board games to me aren't really good at evoking a sense of wonder. And that's one of the things that Elden Ring, which is another video game I've, I've been I played before that and talked about another episode of Bloat is really great. You turn a corner, see something completely unexpected, the joy of wandering around getting lost. I don't have that in board games. What I do get in board games all the time, though, is new ways to gamify stuff, new levers to pull, new approaches to interacting with the game world, which video games don't really do all that often. You have your controller and you've got a D-pad or a joystick and some buttons, and that's more or less it for most things. For a long time. Whereas Dungeon Scrawlers found a way to gamify Connect the Dots. 
How wonderful is that? I love Dungeon Scrawlers. I want. I keep wanting to play. Every time we get together and Dungeon Scrawlers is in hand, I'm like, can we play more Dungeon Scrawlers? And everyone rolls their eyes. But then they have a good time anyway, I would like to point out, because it is an amazing experience. That is Dungeon Scrawlers, Heroes of Underbound by Vangelis Bagiartakis and Konstantinos Karagianis. I got to play So Clover again. This is the second time. I think this is one of my favorite games for party games. It is just so fun. Clever, even? So, yeah, clever. What a great, yeah, so they should put that in the title. Um, so what you're getting is a disc of four words that lock onto your board because there's a square cut out in the middle. And they go on to, it's very hard to explain audioly. It's, so you put them <laughs> on your board so it'll form this square where the four things that you put on your board will put out two words on the edge of each You are given two clues that you must then connect with a third word that you invent or write down such that your partners will then be able to guess how your words were arranged. Exactly. Because what you do is once you've written down your words on this, on this board, you pull off your, your little discs of words and you mix them up and you add a sort of decoy one. And then they take all of your discs and they start fumbling them around on your board and, and trying to figure out what on earth that you were thinking with these words. And I enjoy it every time I play it. So Clover, designed by Francois Romain and published by Repo Productions. I agree. So Clover is a winner. I think I should get a copy. And one of the things that I really appreciate is that ever since Codenames, I think, there's been a solid push towards making sure that everyone gets to guess and give clues at the same time, or not necessarily at the same time, but everyone gets this, gets to do both within the context of the same role. That it's not just divvied up into, I give all the clues, I make all the inferences. And that's one of the things I love about Just One. That's one of the things I love about So Clover. Everyone gets to do both at, at all times, and so you don't feel this bifurcation of job. And So Clover's association and its weird spatiality. Again, it's hard to explain without resorting to images, but there are some interesting spatial corner cases about how to arrange the cards, because while this makes more sense here, but by doing this, we're compelled to make this other inference over here, and that doesn't make as much sense, and it's marvelous. Really well done. Played another game of Hour of Need, and I'm going to be doing a full retrospective of, of all the Blacklist games uh, by listener demand before too long, and Hour of Need remains excellent, and I thoroughly enjoy all my playings of Hour of Need, but on occasion I find it a little bit frustrating. Here's why. One of the things that I wanted Hour of Need to be was sort of the simplest of the Blacklist games, mul- uh, modular deck system games, and to a certain extent, it is. However... It's not simple enough, and one of the things that it does that baked into the design that even Street Masters, which is considerably more detail-oriented, doesn't do, is in our need, you have to sort of collate the effects of multiple different things at once. For example, in order for the stage just to function as it's supposed to do, because this is a superhero game where there are lots of different stages, there's this scheme where mind-controlled dock workers were loading crates of contraband onto a ship, Great evocative setting. That's great. And there's a very simple AI that determines how the dock workers move and what happens when you interact with them and, you know, punch them around a little bit and make them drop their stuff. The problem is in order to get these effects to work, they're not all listed in one place. Some of the effects are listed on the card that comes from the deck. Some of the effects are listed on the board. And indeed, and this is the sin that I cannot forgive, some of the effects are listed in what's called the issue manual. Not a rule book but the sort of flavor text that's going on there. And this is something that the modular deck system has never done before. They've never made you consult for specific rules for a specific scenario or specific hero or specific villain in a separate rules document. They've always been on cards. And so despite the fact that the interactions are relatively simple, they're necessarily spread out all over the place. I don't like having to collate different effects. You can't really get a good solid bird's eye view of what's going on very simply. And so as a consequence you really don't get to leverage the fact that Hour of Need is more straightforward a lot of ways, mechanically, certainly more so than their dungeon-crawling game, namely Ultra Quest. And certainly you have fewer things to collate than Brook City had you do. But nonetheless, I, I just feel that there are these little rough edges that would have that might have come out with a little bit more development. And so I thoroughly enjoy Hour of Need. I think it's a great complement to the existing modular deck series line of games. But I was really, really looking forward to it being maybe 33 to 50% shorter than Street Masters with about 50% less cognitive load. And it doesn't quite 
get there. So as a consequence, I feel that it is a worthy alternative. It doesn't fare quite as well as it could when compared to Street Masters, which remains my favorite modular deck system game by the Sadler brothers. Anyhow, so that's Hour of Need by Adam Sadler and Brady Sadler. I don't mean to sound too down on it. I had a great time and I'm going to keep continue playing with it. It's just there are these little niggling issues that keep coming up on certain combinations of decks and events. I got to put framework back on the table. This is uh, Uwe Rosenberg's re-implementation of uh, Nova Luna, and I also got to play Nova Luna on Board Game Arena, so oh. it was a good way to sort of compare them both, and it definitely has a more refined feel to it, sort of like a streamlined, more developed type game, because they've taken all the scoring, sort of like all the different tiles being worth points, and just, you know, get out your tokens before everybody else does, and mm. I think that's just a better system. And so, yeah, it's a tile layer where you're putting out these different picture frames and you're trying to, you know, sort of match them into different groups. And as you fulfill recipes, you get to put out your 22 different tokens. It seems like it'll take forever, but like you said last time, it sort of ramps up and you suddenly you're putting out four or five a turn. Framework. Does Nova Luna try to have a theme? I don't know. It doesn't seem to have okay. any sort of... I, I didn't actually read the rule book, so I, I'll have to look and see if they try to pass off a theme of some I was kind. just curious, because it's called Nova Luna, it might have some sort of weird kind of... Gotcha. Got to play Cerebria the Inside World. Cerebria is my favorite Mind Clash game. It is the third mi- game that they published. This is designed by Richard Amon and Victor Peter with a long list of collaborators, including, of course, a solo mode by David Turte, because... Why not? Cerebrate the Inside World is a game, and this came up during the stream, that appeals to a lot of people primarily by virtue of its theme. The idea is that it's bliss versus gloom, and they're trying to influence the psychological and mental development of a person through playing emotions and manipulating their mental states. Or not even manipulating, but just representing and manifesting various mental states. The theme I find fine. It's just not my primary source of of appreciation of Cerebria. What I love about Cerebria is that it is a rules-dense, hour-ish long area majority game where things fit together real well and the scoring is straightforward. Anybody who's listened to this podcast for any amount of time knows that while I really like heavier Euros, I tend to prefer... Heavier Euros like Splatter games, because they don't tend to be point salad experiences. They tend to be directly confrontational and have relatively simple rule sets that lead to complicated interactions. Cerebria's rule set is not relatively simple. It's a very difficult game to explain well. And sometimes even the rules explanation is as long as the game itself. But this, I think, is less because the game is overly complicated and more because it gets a lot done in a very short amount of actual playtime. And so I want to play Cerebria at any given occasion. The only problem is I don't get to play it as often as I would like to because of two reasons. Number one, the player count is very restrictive. If you want to play it quote unquote properly, you play it with four, two teams of two against each other. You really want more experienced players if you want to play with other number counts, but you can't get to more experienced players very often because of the restrictive player count in the first place. And a lot of people who want to play Heavier Euro games want the point salad efficiency engine Euro games. And that's fine. That's just not as much my bag. So I adore Cerebria, had a great, great time. And I will point out one thing. Despite the fact that the rules explanation takes a long time, there were practically no rules questions during the entirety of the game, which is really, I think, a tribute to how well, again, how everything coheres and everything hangs together. What were your thoughts returning to Cerebria after all this time, Walker? Still love it. The scoring is very streamlined. I think the emphasis has to be put onto uh, new players is that tell me how I have failed you Walker you didn't <laughs> I'm just joking that you that there is definitely a a build up but it's it's very much uh, there's going to be scoring almost every turn and you can't sort of mm. s- s- you can't rely on setting up your teammate you have to do what you can to get those objectives on your turn because it might not make it to your teammate's turn so if you can possibly get to that goal, then take that chance and push for it that turn. I think I would disagree slightly in that there are ways to set up your partner, but I do agree with you that it is a lot more tactical than it might seem in that, again, scoring is going to happen faster than you think. But yes, that again, I I think is, is more of a virtue than a problem. The strategic horizons can be quite good when you start noticing how the different scoring conditions interact with each other. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. It's not, it's not as though there's no buildup. Because, like you were just about to say, 
earlier scoring conditions will build upon future scoring conditions. Right. So, for example, if very early on one of the scoring conditions is have the most intense emotion on the board, that would dovetail very nicely with have more essence on the board, because generally speaking, the way you get to more intense emotions is by having emotions with more essence on them. And there are ways to help your, help set up your partner with that. If you if you play an emotion right next to where your partner happens to be sitting, they might be in a position to then intensify that emotion or indeed replace it with advanced version. Anyway, but I agree with you. On the face of it, the tactical horizons are more straightforward than the strategic horizons, and it is overall a relatively tactical game. I don't want to exaggerate its strategic horizons, but I absolutely adore Cerebrium Inside World. It was, you know, the the, the I think the glory days of Mind Clash games. I think it's been their best output. An Economical, beautiful package full of great components, really well done and not sprawling with expansions or additional bloat. Not that they've had a bad track record with expansions at all. It's just Perseverance Castaway Chronicles didn't really do much for either of us. And it's got a lot of stuff flying all over the place that doesn't seem to work or hang together very well. And that I don't think can be said of Cerebria. And lastly, for me, I got to play an odd game. It's called Xenoshift. Odd because it is a cool mini or not game with no plastic. This is designed by Karen Philosophiles and Michael Chanel. And it is a deck building game. And I just love the theme. It is aliens pouring into your base while you desperately try to build up your crew. And I don't your... think they're supposed to pour into the base, Walker. Well, it happened in our game. <laughs> See, the problem that we had, Mark, is that we allowed the monsters to unionize and therefore organize. You see? Solidarity forever. In Xenoshift, at least the, what we played the Dreadmire version because it's more streamlined and has better stuff, it has a weather deck. And the weather really affects how the aliens react and apparently the night aliens held up until it was night and the monsoon <laughs> aliens sort of pooled together and waited their turn all of the aliens very nicely organized themselves and wiped us off the planet it's all about scheduling really it it really is apparently they had the app and it went well for them not so well for us but we still loved it and i'm looking forward to bringing it back again i have to say that the the although i like the rules for dreadmire a great deal the base enemies for Dreadmire are, I think, the swingiest, precisely because of how they interact with the weather deck. Every round, you flip over a new bit of weather. And yeah, there are weather effects that you can take advantage of with your own gear, but mostly it affects the aliens more, and there's precious little you can do to prepare it. Uh, that's why I prefer... So, but, but that having been said, if you have the full kit of Xenoshift, which, given how poorly received Xenoshift was, you could probably get the full kit of Xenoshift for, I don't know, five bucks and a smile. There are lots of different alien types that you can play with, and so you don't really have to play with them if you don't want to. Just so. And that is Xenoshift. Finally for me, we got to play a preview copy of Fate Forge Chronicles of Khan. This is by Gordon Kalea at Mighty Boards. This is a pre-release preview version, so all of this is subject to change. But we are big fans of Gordon Kalea's approach to creating compelling combat scenarios. He's done it in Vengeance. He's done it in Vengeance Roll and Fight. And that's the primary reason why I was excited to try Fate Forge. I'm not entirely sure what to think yet, because Fate Forge is about 30-minute combat encounters using the same fundamental die engine of Vengeance, coupled with an app-driven campaign bit. The app-driven campaign bit has not sold me on app-driven campaigns. I'm not gripped by the narrative yet, I don't like any of the characters, and I don't find the setting particularly interesting. I don't know if this is just me. Or what? This is why it, it so much reflects Stars of Acarius that it's some s sort of eerie, right? Because it's poor writing, bad, bad book, and it's exactly four dice that you roll to like the, the slot into it. I think the writing is better it in is better. Fate Forge than yeah, Stars yeah, of Acarius. Oh, it is, it is. Fewer typos, even though this is a pre-release version, yes. <laughs> fewer typos, better writing, better characterization. It's still more plausible, right? We're, we've not been expected to serve as like, the admiral of a fleet That's true. while being Starfighter pilots. But, but it, it's same in the same sort of gameplay. You're rolling uh, specialized dice, four of them, and you're slotting them into recipes. But it just... it flows a little bit better even though we really love the star combat and we're not even going to talk about the the landing combat in stars of carius right but anyway it's it's very much the fantasy version of stars of carius you're blasting through these dungeons you're wiping out the enemies nice fast clean combat and i'm just worried that it takes just as long to set up 
the scenario that it does to actually play through it. Yeah, the thing about Vengeance is you have these pre-made boards populated with really cool evocative art and really evocative enemies, and you blast through about five combat encounters per player per game. And alternatively, what you have in Fate Forge is about a 30-minute combat encounter using some of the same mechanisms, which is great, but you have to set up tiles and fetch the right enemies and, and so forth. Next time, I think I'm going to pay a little bit more attention to how much time that's taking because we've been blasting. I've, I've played two sessions of Fate Forge. Each of them, I played a minimum of three games. So obviously, I didn't find it particularly tedious. So I don't know if this is just more of a, a, a recollection exaggerating the effect of it or not. The thing that concerns me is that when playing Vengeance, part of the game is making sure that when you enter into a combat scenario, you have enough ways to fiddle with your dice. Because most dice games give you lots of rerolls, as per your example of uh, Dice Throne, as per games even that I even really enjoy, such as Assault on Doomrock. The way that it happens in Vengeance and in Fate Forge is you have bought skills to allow you to change dice results into other dice results, or combination of dice results into other dice results. But in the context of a campaign system, obviously you don't start off with a whole heck of much. And so I'm I'm constantly left wondering in games like this, when is the real game starting? Because in your first couple combat scenarios, you're just like, well, I roll the dice and these are my results and this is what I do. It's not particularly as interesting as I recall the fights and vengeance being. And so it, it suffers in comparison with the progenitor. And as a consequence, what I really, really want from games like this actually is a good raid mode, right? Show me what the quote unquote default game experience is. Give me some sort of baseline. Give me some sort of generic make a scenario kind of system whereby I have some skills, but I'm not overburdened with, with things so that it's intimidating. Anyway, I am interested in continuing. I tried with Huey uh, a three-game campaign. We started again with you as well. We're four games into it, and I'm interested in continuing, so that's something. And I just, I, I'm wondering whether and when the campaign trappings will feel that it's adding to the game rather than just suffering as a detraction. Agreed. So that was early experiences with a pre-production copy of Fate Forge Chronicles of Khan by Gordon Kalea and Mighty Boards. And with that, we proceed to the news and why it doesn't matter. In the news this week, we have AGL Tournament Pack Bixie for Aristea. So I'm, I'm glad to see that uh, Aristea is getting support still. So that's a nice thing to see. This looks like a tournament setup full of tournament swag. Ooh. Like for competitive play. Oh. Yeah, because Bixie is already a character. Yeah, it involves it, it, it has a, a, a metal miniature piece and some cosmetic swag and stuff like that. It's weird because, yes, it's continuing to get support, but the past few runs of new Aristea stuff has been purely cosmetic. It hasn't had any new gameplay releases for quite a while. Next up, we have Fantasy Flight Games announcing a Star Wars deck builder, but two-player only. This was announced in their Gen Con live stream. Yay, more Star Wars. No. No. Not for me, anyway. And then something that's a little more exciting, Pandasaurus is teaming up with Elizabeth Hargrave to bring us a game called The Fox Experiment. So this is something that happened in real life where some a couple of Russian scientists got together and tried to breed foxes that could be domesticated because they felt foxes were adorable, apparently. And so that's what you're doing in this game. You're you're. You're taking traits of different foxes and you're trying to breed the most gentle domesticated fox and whoever accomplishes that the best way they can will be the winner. It plays in 60 minutes. So it's, I don't want to say it's a roll and write. It's sort of like a roll and record your rolls in some way. I didn't, I didn't, <laughs> recording I didn't, your rolls is writing, Walker. <laughs> well, yeah, but I, I, I think you get to like keep them for, you know what I mean? I don't think it's like an instant sort right. of effect. Anyway, like I said, I didn't read the rule book. I just looked at it very briefly. It looks very interesting. A little bit of, you know, building up your tableau and doing other things. I'm, I, it's going to, it's going to be coming to Kickstarter, Pen Source Games. I like a lot of Pandasaurus games. I like a, I really liked Mariposas a lot more than you did. And the theme sounds great. I'd be interested in giving that a shot. The Fox Experiment. And that is the news and why it doesn't matter. Now on to the topic of the week, which is done with Simon? <laughs> I don't know if you need the incredulity in there. <laughs> but whatever. I'm, I'm going to stop criticizing your tone and your intonation. Uh, should we start with... 
should we start with why we've always defended Simon in the past? Because I feel like a lot of people have been tut-tutting Simon for a very long time. We have. We we've pretty well just said that it's there, buy it or not. <laughs> That's true. That's true. It's just, I remember while doing some research for just contextualizing our discussion of why we might be done with Simon, or at least a, a large proportion of Simon going forward, I was just reminded of all the really great stuff they've done that's not really particularly consonant with the things that they've done lately. Yeah, you, that, you talked about Xenoshift, for example. Well, that's what my, my main point, is that they've been dealing a lot with IPs, and almost all of the IP stuff that we've tried, we've not liked. They, they're doing a Dune, they've done a bunch of Marvel stuff, they're doing a cyberpunk thing, they've done yep. Masters of the Universe. Yep. All of the stuff does not seem... And and then comparatively to their stuff that has no IP that we've really enjoyed. Yeah. And especially if you look to things that were like 10 to 8 years ago, I'm thinking of things like Dogs of War, which was blinged out but still functional, and it all still fits inside one box, right? Blood Rage, which again, blinged out but still functional, fits in one box. Xenoshift, no miniatures to be found, except for one star player miniature, maybe. Uh, Guilds of Codwallen, which was a, a small box card game that they put out that I have a, small, a certain degree of affection for. And then there's even their loads of plastic stuff that was still really good, but then start still pushing the limits of what we would call, you know, usable. Uh, I liked both editions of Run and Bones. We both have a great deal of enthusiasm for Cthulhu Death May Die. Ankh, Gods of Egypt was our game of the year last year. I really like the others. You really like the others. So we both have our list then of sprawling games that are by no means models of efficiency and we wouldn't even necessarily defend their their mechanisms too too much but we still enjoy playing them for you i think the others falls into that category for me i i had a certain degree of fun with zombicide invader uh i i'm still enjoying massive darkness and so i think that if you're in the mood for something stupid simon has a lot of good stupid stuff for you to enjoy by the same token i should stress it's not like everything that, that Simon did in years past, or even including Ankh, I, I'm willing to approve of. To a certain extent, my early negative experiences with Kickstarter are defined very much with my early experiences with Simon Kickstarter. Zombicide, for me, the first Zombicide, is the epitome of Kickstarter gone wrong to this day, even 10 years later. Not in terms of fulfillment, or lying, or theft, or whatever. Expansions poorly thought out. Hit or miss scenarios that didn't seem to be very carefully designed. Components that were burdensome rather than functional. And ultimately just a whole bunch of stuff that you didn't know how to use and that didn't hang well together. And so just to be clear, as much as I'm willing to defend the design work, especially people like Michael Chanel, you don't see him on the masthead of a lot of Simon designs anymore. He, he did Xenoshift and he did Rum and Bones. And I, I, I think Michael Chanel is a good designer. But ever since Eric Lang parted ways with them, and I'm not willing to associate, I'm just using that as a temporal marker, not a causal marker, right? You're exactly right. More and more IPs and more and more the kind of bloated projects that we can't get behind where things don't necessarily hang together. You don't know how to use the various expansions. And yeah, so that that's one thing of the many issues that we have of, of, of modern Simon. And, and tied into that, let's just talk about the overall plastic. I've made a decision yes. lately that I'm just, I'm going to sort of assess the game. And if I feel that it has too much plastic, I'm not going to have anything to do with it. Yeah. The question has been, you know, well, what, what can one person do? Well, one person can stop buying games that have a ton of plastic. And that's what I'm going to start doing. And again, it used to be the case that for a lot of their designs, one got an impression that the plastic was still functional, still manageable. Again, I, you know, hold up Dogs of War as an example. Or even... Or even something like Blood Rage. But if you compare Blood Rage to even Ankh, for example, same designer, same company, same even overall approach to more stuff, ugh, there's been a considerable approach to bloat. On top of that, I'll get back to the environmental stuff in a, in a second, because I'm, I'm completely with you for what it's worth. Because we haven't even talked about hate. Remember the, <laughs> like the, the pile of plastic uh. that was hate? Yeah, especially when so many of the units were interchangeable with each other, and the design was just so common across everything. Oh, boy. Yeah, it's... The, and I, I, again, under the, the the specific category of things that I will defend Simon over and that we have for a long time, 
people would always criticize him. It's like, oh, you know, they run Kickstarter like a store. Yeah, and so does everybody else on the planet. They rely on hype and stretch goals. Like, yeah, fine. But I mean, if you're coming in with eyes open, the part that I found tiresome as a consumer, this isn't a moral judgment. This is just a preference judgment was the the sort of subtle shift over the course of the past, again, five to eight-ish years, where more and more of the stretch goals were just more expansions to buy in the initial campaign. And the objection I have to that is that this is when I'm in the least good position to know what expansions I want, and the least good position to know what elements will actually add to the game rather than detract from the game. And I feel like I'm being expected to make weirder and weirder decisions because before again even talking about the 2012 release of zombicide you know give them the base pledge amount of money and you'll get a cavalcade of stuff some of which is garbage some of which is isn't but at least i just you either buy the pledge or you don't and now it just seems like the goal is to make the pledge value or at least you know the nominal pledge value that they charge higher and higher and higher it's not a stretch goal to my mind when it's like oh you can give us 50 more dollars now (laughs) it's like we're gonna make this all-in pledge irresistible Exactly. And it's not that I'm not in, that I'm not unable to restrain my FOMO and be able to make these uh, purchasing decisions, but I need some context in order to make these decisions. And I feel that during Kickstarter is the time when I'm least able to, and Simon more and more is doing that. Like for all the criticism that I levy against companies like Arcane Wonders, who are, oh, you got your Foundations of Rome, here's the reprint Kickstarter, or any number of other Kickstarters that run the reprint with an expansion immediately after fulfillment, there at least you give people a chance to play the game once before you have to decide whether you want the expansion, or at least it's been in the wild for a while so you can listen to people's reactions. Simon, not so much. Anyway, let's talk, quickly talk about the remember the time machine. Yes. That was also a nightmare where it was like, hey, can you, you know, buy all this extra stock that we have sitting in our warehouse, please? But we're just going to make it limited and, and you know, you can only get certain things and now they're sold out and now you don't get anything. Yeah, that was weird. I mean, I, I don't know if I'm necessarily willing to blame them for that. It's more the playing fast and loose with what exclusivity means. And there, I'm not even really willing to blame them too, too much because a lot of companies have done that. But I agree with you, circling back to your, to your notion of trying to be a more responsible consumer. Because I agree 100%. Being a responsible consumer is always within people's grasp. Always making the correct choice, not within people's grasp, because there's too much data and it's too difficult to necessarily always make the correct choice. But you can try to make better choices as opposed to worse choices. And again, if I'm going to keep holding up games like Dogs of War as being okay for use of plastic as compared to say the new massive darkness all in pledge where it's like how many boxes do i have with how many different groups of minions and yeah different minions are cool but do i need all the different minions yeah so i think there's a limit to the number of dumb games with boxes and boxes and boxes of plastic that you need that limit may be zero but whatever the limit is i've well passed it (laughs) agreed But let's return back. We've already talked about this. You make a distinction between something like, for example, a massive darkness or like the others. I suspect you'd put that in the same category versus something like HeroScape. Yes. Well, it's a miniatures game where the actual miniature matters. At least not so much. I'm not sure in this new version that's coming out, but there was line of sight rules. Same rules. Same rules. And so you needed needed the miniatures to be there. Yeah. I'm with you. I just don't know whether we're trying to latch on to a distinction without a difference. Because when I think about skirmish games, I think about all the great skirmish games that have zero plastic in them. I think about Titan Tactics. I think about For What Remains. About the 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 quality stuff you can do with tokens. I think also about the quality stuff you can do with standees. You know, you and I have praised the standees in Uprising, Curse of the Last Emperor to the Skies. I saw 3D mock-ups of the cardboard standees for Wonderland's War, and I initially thought that they were going to be those acrylic designs. And having played Wonderland's War a couple of times, the minis are fine, but the distinctive art style would have been captured so much better in one of those acrylic standees. I really wish they'd gone that way instead. Agreed. Well, if, if they had an option for Heroescape with standees, then yes, I would be all over that. Right, but so... Uh... But then there's the question, are we then giving them a pass just because there's already been this system with bloated plastic, and so now we're kind of committed to continuously getting more bloated plastic? I don't know if that's... Well, oh, I, like I said, I have to assess it, right? When you look at something like a CMON project, it's like, well, you can have this unit that has, you know, 
two attacks and one defense or, you know, get this <laughs> add-on that has, you know, one attack and two defense. Right, you know, right. They have, like, these full sets with very little difference, but, you I know, you. different models, right? That stuff is ridiculous as opposed to a HeroScape where every single model is completely different and – and and the you're but just to, just to emphasize for people who haven't played HeroScape, the physicality of the plastic miniature is of consequence in HeroScape. Sometimes, actually, somewhat dramatically, as anyone who's played Q9 properly knows, strictly speaking, according to the rules, Q9's shoulder pads block Q9's line of sight, and so these things these things matter. But again, I, I, I'm with you. I just wonder if I'm giving myself a pass to buy more plastic than I need because it is absolutely the case that this is unsustainable and there's no good reason uh, Foundations of Rome being a good example of this, even though it's not a CMON project. Massive Darkness 2 being a good example for all these things that are probably, let's be frank, going to end up in a landfill and within the next 15 to 30 years. I mean, be, be bluntly honest, like after yeah. I die, what's going to happen to these things? Even before that, if I have to move to a smaller place, what's happening to all this stuff? Of course, I'll try to sell it, but let's be realistic. Yeah. And that's just the finished product. And yeah. That's, that's not even talking about the, what's getting pushed out the back door in order to produce this. Stuff. Absolutely. And as well, and this is where, some, where environmental concerns and more noble concerns intersect again with blunt commercial concerns, the shipping cost. If anything, the sort of reevaluation of Kickstarter more broadly has really redounded to Simon's disadvantage because they tried to be upfront and honest about what shipping was apt to cost for Zombicide Marvel and people damn near had a revolt. Well, this is, again, I will defend their business practice in this instance. They wanted to charge, you know, 80, 90, 100 dollars for shipping. That is what it is probably going to cost. <laughs> and so all the more reason when considering this, even just for your own pocketbook, to consider the virtue of games with smaller footprints. Now let's move on to the wonderful world of blockchains and NFTs. Oh, do we have to? We do. Oh boy. Just a quick, not, not, maybe not everyone knows. I had to educate myself this week on what a blockchain was and what an NFT was. So blockchain is a new way to secure stuff. And it's secure because it's being processed by multiple computers over and over and over again. And therefore it's being reassessed for its validity. And this is why it it costs so much power because this is something that's constantly going on every second, 24 hours a day, nonstop. That is what makes a blockchain a blockchain. The thing about NFTs in particular, the non-fungible tokens, is that there's a whole bunch of different things going on. One of them is this is clearly an effort to look more sexy for investors. Because Kickstarter did the same thing. We're going to move to the blockchain, although they've they've recanted to a certain extent, not as much as I'd like. Simon announced that they were going to have a new digital storefront for NFTs. There's always this patent of respectability about them because one of the things that people say about NFTs is this is a way for artists to get paid. Simon hasn't specifically leaned into this, and it's a good thing they hadn't because, do you know what? If Simon wants their artists to get paid, they could pay their artists more. <laughs> I mean, it's not like these artists that are producing all these assets for these Simon games. Simon has nothing to do with their remuneration, and they have to invent some other way for them to get. No, no, no. This is all. This is all for the artists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No kidding. But besides which, it's basically a massive scam. People have done audits of NFTs. You don't have to be the artist or own anything in order to claim and sell the tokens involved with it. There's a massive amount of fraud, all being covered by this respectable veneer. Well, some be respectable. There's been a huge backlash against NFTs and blockchain, and I'm, for one, I'm very glad of this. But the theory is that it provides some degree, as you say, security or verifiability. Well, it verifies some element of the transaction, but any schmuck can claim that they own a piece of art, secure it through some blockchain mechanism or other, and start selling these non-fungible tokens. There's no way to verify that element, that initial crucial first element of ownership. And that's what's so frightening about it and why it's such a haven for scammers. It is true. But it also, I think that's the one reason why Kickstarter got into it. It sort of removes the need for bank, any banking. That's the, Well, that's the sort of nebulous, super scary later scenario, right? Like, yeah, you, your servers are on the, on the blockchain for now for reasons. What happens next? <laughs> and I'm wondering if there, it's going to get this extra push because there's this huge 
tax law coming into exactly. place now. And I'm wondering if now these blockchains are going to get even more popular because this will be an, yet another way to sort of bypass that system. Exactly. That That's always the question you have to ask when people are talking about moving to the blockchain or engaging in NFTs. What's next? We already have reason to object. But what's coming next? I mean, I don't, again, I don't want to get into conspiracy and we've, we've been defenders of Simon in the past, but, uh, let's remember that for over, uh, that, that for almost a year, Simon stock was suspended trading on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange because their books were regarded as basically not sufficiently well audited. And so there's these weird, I, look, as, as little as I understand about NFTs and blockchain, I understand even less about, public accounting and the requirements for publicly traded corporations and auditing and things like that. But basically the Hong Kong stock exchange said, your books are too sketchy. We will not allow people to trade uh, to, to buy and sell your stock. That happens all the time, right? Well, that's just it. It's hard to tell how, because I, I try to read all about this and you have some analysts saying, Oh yeah, it happens, whatever. Uh, and other people saying, no, this is a sign that something very, very terrible is going on. Now, this doesn't really affect me. I'm not, we're not talking about whether or not one should invest in cool money or not as a stock option, nor are we seriously suggesting that their next Kickstarter project is not going to materialize. That is not something, by the way, that we could claim about, for example, Blacklist Games or Peterson Games. Who knows whether people are going to get their stuff. I have full faith that Simon is going to fulfill everything they've got. Things could change, of course. This is more just an indication that as a publicly traded company that is actively seeking investors of a certain kind, who knows what this NFT dalliance could lead to? This isn't even talking about their weird tech stuff that never materialized, like Tibudu. Remember how Tibudu was supposed to be a whole thing? They still keep talking about it every once in a while. Haven't seen anything about it. Yeah, didn't they have a whole Kickstarter on that? No, they haven't crowdfunded it yet. They were going to, but look, it's hard to it's hard to criticize anyone for delays too badly. There was this whole um, what was that thing that uh, that's uh, that happened and is still happening that's killing. Oh yeah, 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 COVID. <coughs> yeah, oh, yeah. There, yeah. Thank you for the reminder. Yeah. So look, I'm not gonna quibble over delays of Tibudu or whatever. I didn't really care about it to begin with, but it's just I'm getting increasingly the sense. The, they're not really catering to my demands anymore. Again, like I said, I wanted the, I, there's a certain kind of game that I want to play. And for a while, they were doing a great job of delivering that. But they're getting increasingly sketchy, fast and loose with the things that, that really matter to me. And I don't think as a responsible consumer, you can keep supporting these kinds of things. You don't think Marvel Zombicide appeals to the, the, the hardcore gamer market? <laughs> It, it might, and again, I, I it's it. It'd be hard for me to judge a consumer too harshly for getting into it, right? As I said, I've got a lot of big plastic, stupid games that I. It would be irresponsible for me to say it's like people shouldn't be doing this anymore. Now that I've already that I already have mine, and again, we're mooting getting more hero escape. That's right. But and yeah, never mind you know, this giant cyber uh, steampunk that's going to show up, or you know the giant uh, title blades two that's going to show up. Soon. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. But but your point is still well taken. Just because our hands aren't completely clean doesn't mean we can't try to minimize the effect of these things. And that is why with the heavy, we're having a heavy reevaluation of our attitude towards plastic. And given that heavy reevaluation of attitude towards plastic, other than Ankh, I can't really think of anything that Simon has done over the past few years that would pass those, those considerations. And even Ankh is iffy. Like... <laughs> Because again, I, I I have a much the moment you can't fit it into one box, <laughs> and the setup and teardown starts to become a sufficiently elaborate, still a marvelous game, but I feel a little bit embarrassed about it. <laughs> yes, sort of like weep openly when you <laughs> the the smell of plastic erupts across yeah, the table. Yeah, it's actually not entirely unlike. Some games, some of them perhaps by Simon, that are really, really well done, that have objectionable depictions of women. It's like, this is a great game, but I'm kind of embarrassed about this thing. Maybe. So in, in an environment where we should stop having to apologize for these things and make these excuses, as well as moving away from games that have unfortunate depictions of women and have, you know, racist dog girl in the rule book or what have you. We're now entering an era where we're being incredibly critical and skeptical of things with huge amounts of unnecessary plastic. And just to double down on that, we are having this retrospective. Re we're not saying that anyone else should. Absolutely. Or, you know, that, that you know, the company should do anything. We're saying we yep. are changing how we look upon this hobby. 100%. And to a certain extent, we're having this discussion just because 
we're not sure where we are yet. We haven't reached hard and fast decisions, right? That, that The question mark in Done With Simon is doing a lot of work. And who knows? Their next project could be the second coming of something like a Xenoshift. There's always chances for companies to pivot. Michael Chennault could come out with a great filler or a great little deck builder or a great little area majority game or something. And it is entirely possible that they do something somewhat responsible with it and not associate it with, you know, blockchain to the NF- NFTs or trying to make it a backdoor into some weird tech project or, or, or what have you. We will we'll have to wait and find out. I mean, I'd be somewhat surprised, but it's not. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not holding my breath, but. Exactly. Well, that's going to do it for this week for So Very Wrong About Game. Thank you very much for joining us. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can find all our contact information at sowronggames.com slash contact. We'll read everything you send us and we will get back to you if we can. Thanks again for spending your time with us and we hope to see you again soon. Peace! You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Biggin. Special thanks goes to What Does It Eat for generously allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our theme. You can find them at whatdoesiteat.com. You can reach us by email at soverywrongaboutgames at gmail.com or on Twitter at sowronggames. Thanks very much. See you next time. And always, try to be right, but remember you are so very wrong. Thank you, everyone, for joining us once again for the glorious revival and return of Masterpiece Theater in honor of His Grace, the Reverend Dr. Dr. Vincent Duke of Diesel, Esquire OBE. This week, we will be celebrating the mighty film, the motion picture, Prey. Walker, your thoughts on Prey? Prey is a fantastic addition to the Predator series, I think. I think it was sort of on a downslope, maybe, you could yeah. say. Sort of like a, you know, Friday the 13th Part 9. <laughs> type of direction and this sort of pulled it back to almost like the very first sort of you know it's you know early age of earth and the and the predators have come down and they're hunting warriors of the of north america yeah comanche comanche yeah in order to make a satisfying crowd-pleasing blockbuster more isn't always more right it can be a small this isn't like a small, independent, sort of intimate film, right? But it can be small, be a constrained narrative, and have stakes. That's the thing. Stakes make things like this a lot more interesting and enjoyable very much of the time. The other thing that I'd like to point out is that a lot of the criticism of Prey, I mean, there's a lot of racist and misogynist criticism of Prey. There's, I've seen more of it than I care to, and I wasn't even going and looking for it. But like... The fight choreography was badass and plausible all at the same time. No weird, incredible backflips or like massive 30 foot long lumps or uh, jumps or things like that. Just somebody using their abilities in a clever way to overcome a problem. And that's satisfying to watch. Yeah, character growth. Imagine exactly. That in, a, in a film. Clever blocking, clever staging. It allows you to set up, have set up and pay off. Really, really, really well done. The only serious problem I have with it. And normally I'm not the guy who cares too much about special effects. CG animals, I think, are ruining movies. Yeah. (sighs) The CG bear was bad. It was bad, which is weird, right? Because I don't know if you you probably haven't seen it, but they did a whole Lion King movie that was completely CG animals. I haven't seen it. And, And that is very well done. Part I don't, of it, I, have I don't to, know what happened. Maybe it's just budget. Part of it is budget, yes. This is a relatively small budget Hulu thing. If it had been a major theater release, which we still occasionally have, they might have dumped more money into it. But on the topic of the Predator franchise, I'm not going to get into spoilers, but the very uh, the very strange connection to the rest of the Predator franchise was very cool. I liked that a great deal. I... I'm one of those freaks who quite likes Predator 2. It's a dumb movie, but I thoroughly enjoyed it. What did you think of the 2010 movie Predators? The one with Adrian Brody. Have you seen that? I I think I've seen almost all of them, except for the one just before this one. The Predator. The Predator. The one that everyone hates. Yes. I haven't seen it either, but yes, everyone hates it. No, I liked them all. I like like the sort of the whole feeling of it. The fact that, you know, that they might be the ones that are behind the alien sort of infestation that they sort of populated world so they could go hunt the aliens and all sorts of that kind of thing, hunting, th- you know, humans, you know, going up in the ranks, proving yourself your work. Cause it sort of feeds in sort of, I liked how they sort of windowed. They didn't really show that in, in prey, but it's, it's sort of, 
it sort of reversed the role sort of it showed how she's trying to move up into the you know the ranks yep of warrior and that's exactly what all the predators are doing but they didn't really show that which was unfortunate no i think it was a good parallel it, it, was, it was subtly implied it was subtly implied to people who know the franchise i'm sure but okay. if, if if you're just coming in fresh you you i don't think you would have any idea fair enough but to a certain extent, to a lesser extent, but to a certain extent, I got the same feeling while watching Prey that I got when watching John Wick when it first came out. This is how you do an action movie. This is just such a marvelous antidote to a lot of big budget, big budget stuff. There's less bloat. It's smaller. It's constrained. The action is exciting and well set up. There's there's world building that's done. There's set up path. I, I thoroughly enjoyed Prey. Yep. I recommend it for anyone. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Check too. it out. Thank you very much, listeners, for joining us for the glorious return of Masterpiece Theater in honor of His Grace, the Right Honorable Reverend Dr. Dr. Vincent, Duke of Diesel, Esquire, OBE. He should do a Predator movie. That would be sweet. Oh, my goodness. Predator movie where he's both the Predator and the non-Predators. Exactly. Someone suggested that he should be in a, in a Jane Austen adaptation, and my response was he should play every role. Just so. <laughs>